So today I have a title called Removing the Fear of Sin. Removing the Fear of Sin. And um, I think this title, I've been validating this title for quite a while. I've been, ever since I've been on holidays, I've been just hearing things, not just from there, but just hearing things all the time. And I hear the fear of people. And the fear is of them not being obedient. The fear is, not to, uh, the fear is that they might have sinned and they don't even know it. <laughs> uh, the fear is that I've done something wrong, but maybe I don't know what I've done wrong. There's that fear that we live in. We come into a culture or a religious culture or a religiosity that there is sometimes where we've been told to make sure that we're clean before we go to bed. You ever heard that? And so what we do is, and I'm not making fun of this. If you need to do it, then go for it. But the fact is, that we go to bed and say, Lord, please forgive me. Uh, whatever I've done wrong, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, God, but if I've done anything wrong, please forgive me, right? We, we try to, and we're scared to go to bed because we think we might be struck dead and we'd sinned and we didn't be able to make it right. You ever been there? In a, in a poor, yeah, anybody? Okay. And that, that's not the right way to think because God died for those sins already. And if you don't know what you're confessing about, it's not a confession no more. If you don't know what you're asking forgiveness for, it's not forgiveness no more. So you're asking God to forgive you of something that you have no clue what you're asking Him to forgive you, so there's no power in it because there's no confession in it. You need to have confession. The Bible says to repent, you need to confess. You can't repent if you can't confess. Right? So get rid of your fear. Hey? Let's get rid of it. not being so scared that we do everything wrong because we're, we're pretty good people. Because we have Christ Jesus within us. We're above average people. Amen? And that's where this message has come from. I, I, I've heard a little bit about it, and I steal things all the time, so when I hear things, I use it. And, uh, but it's just that fear that people rise in, and we, we are brought up in that culture that our God is always looking over us and making sure. <laughs> if you've done something wrong, we're going to slap you one, man. <laughs> and, and that's the way we've been brought up. I remember those days. And then it hadn't been that long ago. Oh God, I still sometimes get caught in that. Oh, I feel anxious or something because I know God's working in me. Oh God, have I done something wrong? Because I don't want this to go away. I don't want this to know. God, God, where, 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 forgive me if I've I done something wrong. God, oh, God, you know, you feel this anointing and you don't want to lose it. So you're, you're making sure you're cleaned up. There's nothing wrong with um, recalling things. There's nothing wrong with looking back. But if you can't come up with nothing, just leave it alone. Right? Yeah. And I think we find ourselves caught in that. And if I'm offending anybody, I do apologize ahead of time. But I do not apologize for the word, though. Because it's truth. The truth is we need to rise up as Christians and know that we are better than what we think we are. We need to know we have something better than we think we have. Amen? Stop being fearful, people. We're not mites. We're men and women of God. So we've been taught religiously that we're just small mites. Well... You might not be much of something without Jesus, but you have Jesus, so you're a lot of something. Amen? You're quite a bit of something. And so get rid hold of that, quite a bit of something. <laughs> so I want to study sin, and I don't think I ever preached on the word sin before. Sin itself, I have mentioned it, I have, st I have definitely brought it into my messages. But I want to focus on the word sin a lot today. Because I think we misinterpret what sin is. And sometimes we don't understand sin. So we're, we're repentant of stuff that's not even sin sometimes. We need to understand what sin is. Sin is not a temptation. Temptation is not a sin, put it that way. Sin is when you give in to temptation. Temptation is not a sin. Being tempted is not a sin. It's when you give in to what you're tempted of. That's the sin, right? So we often get guilty of because we've been tempted or because we had one wrong thought and we, we washed it out. It was a place of thought or a temptation, right? And we're living in the place of guilt. And the devil loves doing that to us. He says, <laughs> you know what you want. You know what you're thinking. No, I'm not thinking it. No, no, get out, get out. <laughs> right? We've got to walk in that place of understanding that God is way more gracious than we ever can imagine or think. His grace is way more abound than we can ever imagine or think. Amen? So the word sin itself in the whole Bible... Uh, the, uh, so these are the words I looked up. I want to see how much time sin was talked about in the Bible. I looked up sin, sinners, and sinful. Those three words are found in the Bible about 584 times. 
584 times. So sin was a big subject in the Bible. There's some words that are only used once or twice in the Bible, or three times in the Bible, but sin was used 584 times. So there is something important to understand about sin if it is mentioned that many times in the Bible. And we need to understand that because we have to understand sin so we understand what we're redeemed from. Because if we don't understand sin, we never know what sin is, so we think everything's sin. And we're never redeemed from sin because we're always walking in a place of fear of sin. So if we bring some understanding to sin, we stop having the fear of sin because we understand what sin is. Amen? Are you with me? That's my favorite word. If it bugs you, I'm sorry. But I, I often catch myself doing, are you with me? <laughs> we all have our flaws, and that's one of my flaws. I like to ask people if they're with me. So are, are, you, are we good with that? Are we get, grabbing hold of this? I just want you to pull like crazy today because this is going to be a revelational and it's going to free you and it's going to deliver you and it's going to even possibly heal you because you're going to be freed from this fear. Amen? And I can say that you all, and I think we all can say that we have that fear of doing stuff wrong and we have the fear that God will see us do something wrong. Would you agree? And, and the thing is we need to remove that fear. There's some ways to remove the fear. One, one place is just to repent quickly. There's one way to remove move fear. Another way to remove fear is just simply, uh, simply don't involve yourself in the sin so you don't have to be fear of the sin. And so the thing is, I have this one statement here, but I'm, I'm going ahead of myself, but it's all good, right? <laughs> Praise God. But I'm going to say that statement because it just falls in with it. What I believe in when I study sin, sin is a lifestyle. So if, if sin is not your lifestyle, you're not a sinner. Sin is a lifestyle. But if you sin once in a while because you made mistakes in your life, then you're disobedient. It's still sin, but you're disobedient, but you're not a sinner. A sinner lives it. A sinner walks in it. A sinner does whatever he takes to live in that and, and doesn't remove himself. So we often think that we, uh, you are good people here. Would you agree? Would you agree that you are born-again believers, holy ghosters here? Amen. And, and, and so you're not a sinner, in my opinion. You just kind of slip once in a while. I know that. I know how that works. <laughs> you know, you slip. And then you sin once in a while. Then you repent quickly. It doesn't make you a sinner. It just makes you that you sinned. Amen? So we've got to get ourselves right with God and say, God, I'm not a sinner. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a son and daughter of God. I am somebody that you have chosen for your kingdom that you have chosen for great things, that you have chosen to be blessed. Amen? And, and I want to walk in that place today. So let's, let's just go read some scriptures here. Matthew 1, 20 to 21. And just going to set a foundation of it a little bit, but just follow along with me and just flow with me. Matthew 1, 20 to 21. This is after, this is when Jesus was coming to this earth and Jesus was coming alive to this earth. It says, but while... He thought on these things. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, you the son of David, fear not to take Mary, your wife, to you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And I believe the Lord is saying, what is conceived in you is of the Holy Ghost. Stop fearing. Stop fearing what is within you and start operating with, with, within you. Start operating in the power of the Holy Ghost. Just listen to this more. And, he's, and, and she shall bring forth a son and, he, and you shall call his name Jesus. And that word Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. So when Jesus came to this earth, I'll just read, finish reading this, for he shall save his people from their sins. He shall save his people from his sins. So here we have Jesus hasn't even been born yet, but it's in the womb. And there's already a promise laid out for us that we don't have to worry about sin. That we don't have to fear about sin. He says, I bring forth a son. His name is going to be Jesus. His name, Jesus, it says, Jehovah, Jehovah is salvation. It means that his name is Jesus. It's God himself here as salvation for you. Jehovah is salvation. That's what Jesus means. The word Jesus means God, part of God. The, uh, God himself came here on earth so that you can have the fullness of salvation. Jehovah is salvation. So Jesus came as God in that place of salvation, in that place of fulfillment, 
sozo, the fulfillment of everything that you could ever imagine or think. And he says he will save his people from their sins. He will save their people from their sins. Everybody just say, just re-look at this one more time. I'm just going to repeat this until we get it, okay? <laughs> For he shall. Everybody say shall. shall. Say it again. Shall. That's right. Let's get involved a little bit here. Save his people from their sins. It mean, he shall save his people from his sins. It's pretty powerful in my opinion. Where are you walking today? If you walk with that Jesus that was born in Bethlehem, your sins are removed if you choose to allow yourself to walk after him. Amen? We need to walk in that place of removing the fear of it. But let's just look at the word sin for one moment here. Now, sometimes we think sin is doing something evil, but it's not doing something evil. Sin is, is, a, is a broad word that was used in the Old Testament and the New Testament to describe yourself walking away from God. It's a word used. You can study it in the Greek yourself. It's studied, or in Hebrew if you want to, but you can study it yourself. It's a word that is used where you're misled away from the right path. The, the word itself is that you be mistaken. So you walk and you make a mistake. That is, that is a sinful nature. Anything that's not within God is a sinful nature. So we have a fear of sin, but we have a relation of sin as pornography. We have a relation as sin as stealing. We have a, or the Ten Commandments, for instance. And we relate ourselves to sin in those areas, but we don't relate ourselves into sin that really what sin is. Sin is whatever you do and you mistake yourself or you've withdrawn yourself from the path of Jesus Christ. It is a place, it's a word of action in your life that you choose to do. It's not a place where because you made a mistake in your life. It's not a place because, because just because you're addicted to something. Oh boy, I'm going to touch some toes here, I'm telling you. <laughs> People say, well, that's a sin. It is a sinful nature, but addiction has to be healed before the sinful nature can be removed. People don't understand that, that, that God is still within a person, even if there's an addictive state in there. People say, well, I, I'm addicted to it. I can't stop this. It's controlling you. Well, that means you need some major help. But that is not hard to get out of there, but you are still living in guilt because people live in guilt and says, I can't quit anyway, so I might as well just sin. And so they're living in guilt of addiction more so than the sin itself. And so because of the addiction of that place, whatever it may be you're involved, it might be gambling, it might be this, it might be that, I don't know what you're, in, you're addicted to. <clears throat> but we are called that addicted that we, God can never forgive me, but I can't stop myself. You're wrong. God is way bigger than your thinking or your understanding. God is with you, and that's why he wants to help you out of those things. Amen? We have to choose not to be guilt-driven or condemnation-driven when the word sin comes around. We need to choose to fight and overcome sin, not fear it. Sin is not meant to be feared. Sin is, sin is meant to be overcome. Amen? And so it means to, do, it means to wander from the path, uh, then of, you go into the path of unrighteousness. It means to wander off the greatness, or uh, sin means to wander from honor. It means to wander. It means to remove yourself and violate God's law in your life, meaning that you choose not to follow God's law in your life. Sin is a place of disobedience. What does disobedience lead you into? Deeper sin. It leads you into addiction. It leads you into all kinds of things in that place. It is which one brings offense to somebody. It brings a place of violation to somebody. It brings, the, the, it brings you out of the divine. Sin is a place where we are fearful of, but at the same time, a lot of us don't sin as much as we think we do. Because we live in a fear of it. Most people that are born again believers fight their hearts and they choose and desire for more of God. And we live in the guilt of sin so that we never reach that place. The enemy wants to put that guilt on you today and say, Oh, you sinned again. You might as well just not go to church because you're just a sinner. He will tell you that. <laughs> you're a sinner. You're a sinner. Yeah, guess what? It was born that way. The sin is something that will attract us for the rest of our life. What are we going to do with it? All right? What are we going to do with something that is magnetized to us because of what the enemy has done to this world? The only thing we can do is serve the opposite than the sin. And we can walk in the fullness of blessing of that. Remove the guilt and stop thinking that you're a sinner all the time. 
so that we can walk in the blessing of God and say, God, here I am. I make a lot of mistakes. I don't call them sin. I just get up and go again. I repent, move forward. Repent is not because you've done something wrong. Repent is change your mind in what you did and do something right. Turn around anointing, basically. Turn away from the things are, that you are suffering with and turn into God's blessing. That's what that is. Amen? So, I believe this. If you truly are a sinner, it's your lifestyle. You know, I heard an interesting statement once, not that long ago. How can you tell when people are born again? How can you tell they truly are born again? Does it all, all, does it all of that it takes, is it just a sinner's prayer that it takes? Oh Lord, please forgive me. As somebody is bullying you into the corner and saying that you should say the sinner's prayer. What does it take to truly be a believer? Well, it takes you to be a new creation, to be a believer. And new creation will represent itself according to its creation. So people say, well, I, I sin, I have addicted, so I'm not a god. But you know what? As long as you feel bad about you, what you do, as long as you feel something in there, saying, I know that's not right, you are a believer, 100%. You still got it. As soon as you have addiction and you feel terrible every time you do it, and you say, God, please forgive me. Guess what? You have the Jesus within you. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't care. Because you would still live in old creation. Old creation doesn't care. New creation cares. So you, ha you can know that you're a believer when you feel moral antinocies or when you feel something going on in your heart and you feel convicted every time something goes wrong. That's how you know you're a believer. If you're just a person that wants to please somebody by coming to church and just saying, yeah, I'm a good guy, and you're still going out and doing the thing, and you don't feel bad about what you, what you do, you know, we have to probably question you a little bit then. Right? I'm not saying addiction, because addictions you go do, and you feel bad that you do, but it's addiction, right? We need to be healed from addictions. So I'm hoping that I'm getting that out a little bit. I want to get out to a place as Christians that you don't have to be guilty of sin no more. That you are redeemed of the Lord. Hallelujah. So sanctified. So washed that you can never imagine. I'm going to just, I have to read on because there's so much scripture for Ho, 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 ho. Matthew 3, 6 says that, uh, and we, and we're baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing the sins. Meaning that even where John the Baptist was, they were confessing their sins. They were already f uh, confessing their trespasses, meaning that the sin was not a place of coming against Jesus Christ. It was come in a place where they were misled or mistaken or taken away from the law of God. They were removed from it because Jesus didn't die yet and the new law didn't take place yet. So they were confessing of their sins. They were confessing of their mis errors. They were confessing of the wrong path they were going on. They were not all murderers. They were not all abusers. They were not all that. They were just on the wrong path. That's called sin. There's many people that we understand that don't even have Jesus Christ and we call them sinners. Why do we call them sinners? They have good families. They love their kids. They are not abusers. They're not going around and having affairs. But we still call them sinners. Why do we call them sinners? It's because they're not followers of God. Are you followers of God? That doesn't, then makes you a non-sinner and makes you somebody that slips once in a while but doesn't make you a sinner. It makes you a son and daughter of God. It makes you a place of blessing. It makes you to say, I can rise up and not be fearful no more. And I don't have to fear of sin no more. And if it comes, I repent and turn around. A sin is a willful action. It's not a mistake, okay? It's a willful action. You find out later on that you're doing something that's not of God, you repent, but you didn't realize it was sin when you did it sometimes, right? Choose to walk in the place where you can remove the guilt so you can move forward because the guilt holds you back. Every time you do something, okay, uh, this good example here when she was saying, uh, we didn't experience falling down. Well, what if it's not of God? Who cares? Just get it out of your head. Why? Because it's about your heart and God. People say, well, well, what if? See, that is already you're having a fear of doing something wrong. Right? We see that so often. We've been accused that by that by religiosity, by people saying, well, they fall down there. Well, one thing we do is that you can fall down on purpose or by God, or we can throw you down. It doesn't really matter how you go down. We can get you down. It's just, <laughs> so there is no judgment call no more. <laughs> 
So you go up here, watch somebody. Oh, okay, you can probably go think, did he push him down or did he fall down by himself or did God, Holy Spirit do it? You can think all you want and you'll never know because we give that permission here. Why? We remove the religious thought of it and we remove the place of saying, I might sin out of this place. Don't worry about it. Choose to follow God. If you follow the heart of God and you come here for the sincere heart, God meets your sincere heart. He doesn't care if you fall down, lie down, or kneel down. He doesn't matter right now. He says, that's your body. Go ahead. Go for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Guess what? I made it that you could lie down. So just go for it. He didn't. He, he's not holding it against nobody, right? We've got to remove the fears of sin in our life. If we have many people that won't fall in the power of the Spirit because they're fear of what the Holy Spirit's going to do there, and they're fear that the, something's going to get wrong in there. They have the fear that it might be the devil. They have the fear that it might be a wrong spirit. They have the fear of that. There is no wrong spirit here. It's Jesus Christ himself. The only thing that's wrong is me, maybe, okay? Or you, maybe. The mistakes don't happen by God. They happen by the human nature, amen? So, accept my mistakes. I accept yours, right? Simple as that. No more fears. Just remove it all and say, here I am to receive from God himself through a vessel that is unperfect because that's what he chose to use. Hallelujah. He chose to use you are you perfect? Okay. Let's just go for it. Let's not be fearful no more of sin. Let's not be fearful of the wrong. What if that happens in a service? What if somebody speaks in tongues in a service? It's none of your business. Just keep quiet. But what it, well, it's not your judgment. It was between them and God. You have no say in what they're doing. You have no say in their worship. We are too busy thinking right and wrong when we should just serve our Lord Jesus Christ in everything we do. Amen? People say, well, there is wrong. Absolutely, then don't do it if you think it's wrong. Just stay away from it if you don't feel good with that, right? Bring understanding into this place. It is when you miss the mark, that's the sinful nature in your life. When you choose not to follow Jesus Christ. Yes, you need to repent and turn around. I'm going to get there. That's what I am. <laughs> You're still good? You're not falling asleep on me yet? No? Okay, good. I think I need more heat. I mean, more fan. <laughs> heat, more heat of the Holy Spirit, more air. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. I like that when I do that because on a video I record and I find myself going to the fan sometimes. Matthew 18, 21 to 22. Did you know in the Bible that you can actually not just sin against God, but you can sin against each other? Sinful nature come against the body of Christ, and you are body of Christ, so you can be sinned against. And this is where Peter was talking. So in verse 21 of 18 in Matthew, it says, then, Peter, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? How often should this brother sin against me? So this sin is the exact same word as before that I explained before. It's somebody that brings offense to you. Somebody brings fault to you. Somebody that misses the mark with you. Somebody that just didn't get you. Somebody that just kind of hurt you. That's sinful nature. There's somebody that just kind of wanted to get you going, somebody that just wanted to accuse you, that's a sin against you. And so Peter says here, how often <laughs> should this guy come against me and I forgive him? How often? Till seven times? So Peter was really smart in that area because seven is Jesus is one of Jesus' favorite numbers. And so he says, should I do this seven times? Now I've talked about this a little bit, but I want to bring it into a little different concept right now. How often shall you how often should somebody sin against me before I forgive him, and how many times should I forgive him? And Jesus is really smart here, and he says, Peter, you think you got it, but you don't. Jesus answered, and Jesus said to him, I say not to you until seven times, but until 70 times seven. 70 times seven. 70, that's 490 times per one sin. Oh, my goodness. And I have people that do five, ten things wrong, so that's like, I can't count as high as many times I have to forgive somebody. Whoo, my, my. Means this is that God doesn't just give you one chance, not two chances. He gives you many, many chances. He never gives up on you. 490 times per sin, per something that somebody said wrong to me, per one sin, per one, one misled, for one mistake, for one fault, for one... And, and, and they do 20 of them sometimes. They do... And I have to just honestly... This is a metaphor that Jesus was saying that there is an unending forgiveness in your heart that I guess I live in you and you have no choice because I can forgive at all times. And if you grab a hold of the center of your heart and you grab a hold of the spirit within you, you will never fail and you will always be able to forgive and always let it go. Isn't that amazing? And then he says, so the thing is that 
people sin against me, if you want to call it that. That's what the Bible says. But I just have to constantly forgive them all the time. All the time. You know what? Human nature says no. Oh, my goodness. If I had that, they deserve some revenge here, man. <laughs> I just want to get even with them, and I'm going to say my mind to them, and I come to this place, and I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to talk to them. Oh, how are you doing today? <laughs> and, I, and my whole voice changes because there's something within me that's Jesus Christ doesn't let me <laughs> yell at them no more. All of a sudden, God shows me their heart, and I said, God, I didn't want to see that. I wanted to get even with them. And, and, and all of a sudden, I changed my tone with these people, and I start saying, oh, oh, you know, that really did hurt me, but I forgive you. And all of a sudden, everything changes. I was going to give you my mind, and, and for some reason, God's mind came out of me instead of my mind, and, and it totally got confused, and I got scrambled. I didn't even know what I was going to say no more, and so I just had to go with what God was going to say. Isn't that pretty powerful God that we have? That's a pretty powerful God we have. And so he said this to them. So if people come against you, if they offend you, that's what the word sin means. If they come and, and mislead you or they take, uh, they take your share away from you, meaning they, they remove from you from the family, they remove you from the sphere of influence, they take that share, they're, they're dividing themselves. Forgive, 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 forgive. Easier said than done, right? Very simple, put in the word of God, simply done. 70 times 7%. 490 times. I guarantee you, if you forgive somebody 490 times for one thing they've done, it'd be long let go by the time you do that. Yeah. I, I think that you know, maybe you should keep count. Just kidding. Don't do that because you're going to go crazy. <laughs> so I'm going to give you an example. Let's say if you had a father or a parent or an uncle or a stranger or somebody, an abuser, okay? That's the hardest thing for people to forgive. And that's sin because they were misled. They were brought to fault. They offended you. They accused you. They violated you. They did it all, right? And I'm telling you that sometimes it takes 490 times to let that go. That person already forgot about it. That person is moving on and you are holding it and it's just bothering you because it's an inner hurt. And you're trying to let go of something that happened 25 years ago and you just can't do it. Maybe you didn't do it enough. People say, I don't know how to forgive. I tried once. <laughs> you haven't tried until you've done it 490 times. Well, I did forgive him, but I'm still angry with him. Well, do it a little bit more times. And I often talk to people about the he healing the past. And when I see them actually release them, because that was a sin that was done against them and against God. That was a violation. And that is, not a, that is a touchy subject. And that is not something to be desired of. And that is something that I understand it's hard to forgive. But the fact is, if we would grab a hold of it and say, Jesus said that you need to say it till you get it. You need to do it till it registers in your head. You need to do it till it gets into your heart and let go completely. Amen? It's a metaphor saying, I'm letting it go. And I have to do that with a lot of things in my life, and I've been successful. I'm letting it go. Oh, I'm letting it go. Then somebody says, well, what about that guy in the past? I let it go. Don't talk about it. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> One of my pullers came in. <laughs> the guy with the tow truck that pulls everything out of me for God to him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And so, are you ready to be that kind of person? Are we ready to not let sin fear us no more? But are we really just to overcome it? Are, are we, let's just, you are not a sinner as a Christian. You are maybe disobedient, and maybe you're addicted to something that you think you're a sinner. Yes, you are living in sin, but because of Jesus Christ, you're not a sinner. Stop living in sin and become fully what God has designed you to be. Amen? I ha you don't need to go to bed no more wondering if you did something wrong. I don't want to go to bed tonight and say, what did I say wrong here? I don't want to do that. Because it takes forever to figure out what I said wrong. Until I watch a video sometimes. <laughs> and I find out it was not that wrong, but I was kind of saying, why in the world did that come out of my mouth? Okay, God, if you're using it, so be it. 
man, that was funny. I said, I, I, I re just recently, about the last year or so, I started watching myself on video. And before that, I couldn't do it. I just, every time I turn it on, <laughs> I'll just listen to it, shut it down, shrink it down, just a voice. All of a sudden, you're sitting there and you're listening to a voice and you're forgetting who it is. And you're going, amen, yes, hallelujah, praise God. Oh, that's me. I didn't hear that before. You ever been there? You'll find out later on that somebody said something you said and you never knew you said it until somebody said you said it. That's what prophecy works. That's how God works. That's right. Let's not go there. But God is that way. And God uses you. And you sometimes don't even remember what he used you for. Because it was not about your glory. It was about his glory. I prophesied so many times and people say, I remember Pastor just saying, I'm going here. Like, oh, man, I wish I could remember that. You know, oh, man. I, I, okay, I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> if it's good, I'm going with it. If it's bad, I'm going to argue the point. But if it's good, we'll go with it. <laughs> but you, you know how, what I mean. You've been there. I know you guys have been there. When you also feel like something just compelled that you say, and later on, you forget what you say. But God is so gracious. Every time that person comes back, he brings it back to my memory, what the Holy Spirit does. Like, I didn't, I didn't remember what I prayed for that woman for that testified here until she starts talking. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Because I pray for so many people, and, and God uses us, and we don't even think about the people. We do think about the people. That's just so wrong. <laughs> we really think about the people, but your mind is not in what the person's done wrong. It's in the heart of the person. So you forget everything that person's done wrong because now you just got a hold of their heart. I, I celebrate so much. Oh, you know, I celebrate like she's healthy. Oh, oh hallelujah. I f totally forgot. Right there, that instance is like having a newborn baby. Just right there. It's just like you forget every pain, every, everything. It just goes away completely. That's what happens when deliverance happens. You just forget everything. You just celebrate. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate that he sets free. We're not demon seekers. We're getting rid of them. We remove them. We overcome them. But we're not seekers of them. We remove them. So we seek Jesus through that. Amen? Oh, I love it. I love my job because I don't have to remember nothing. It's the easiest job ever. I don't have to go back to a recycling place or a, a, a work line and say, oh, how do I do this? The Holy Spirit's always alive. It comes again and says, okay, God, I have no idea what I'm doing. And he goes, <laughs> just comes out because he does it. Amen? It's all him that gets the glory. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> you guys got a little bit more time, don't you? I thought so. Great. <laughs> Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Verse 18 to 19, uh, 20. Acts chapter 3, 18 to 20. This is right after the gate beautiful. This is where Pete and John came and said, I have no money, I have no silver. How many times do you ever feel you have no money? Anybody? Yeah? No, I don't know if they had no money or they just forgot it at home or they just got a habit of leaving at home because they knew they were beggars. I don't know. And sometimes you just say, I don't want to give today. Leave it at home, then the church can't ask me to give. But anyway, whatever it may be, isn't it true? Come on. I've been there. I, I, I'm, when, I used to not, when I used to be a tight tither, if you want to call it that, when I had to squeeze out of my wallet, when every dime and I had to get, have the exact change and everything, when I used to be like that, it hurt. And, and so I said, okay, God, just in case you get weird on me, I'm le only taking 10% along of my money. I'm leaving the rest at home because I want to go for lunch later. There has been times where I went home and got that money. I said, man, if I would have just done it the first time, I wouldn't have had to walk home and miss a part of the service. But you know what? It's the obedience of our heart. And so either way, whatever reason they didn't have money, they didn't have it for one reason. It's because God, that person needs to open his heart for something else. And sometimes you don't have money, but you, you have the ability to open your heart to receive healing today. Maybe you have nothing to your name, but you can give something of yourself today. You can give your love. You can come in agreement with the message today. You can come in agreement when people come prayer. You can give something today. Amen? We can remove sin from this place and have no errors in this place and have Jesus in this place. I thank God that I'm not perfect because I laugh about myself all the time. I thank God that I'm making mistakes because I'm learning more all the time. I thank God for those things. I just thank God I don't stay there. Right? So when something repeats itself, there's a problem if it repeats itself too often. Unless if they're habits, it's different. Like, are you here? <laughs> are you with me? <laughs> Those are habits, just so you know. <laughs> so God, will, let's just look at Acts chapter 3, verse 18 to 20. 
This is where you have to get beautiful. And they just rolls this guy around. This guy's running around, leaping and jumping, praising God. And she was, in my eyes, like, I don't know if you saw that lady that testified here. Everything was shaken. Hallelujah. I love that when people are nervous, because then God comes out of it. When people are cocky, and nothing works really. But when people are nervous and are, are submitting to what God did to them, when you come humble before the Lord, your voice can tremble, everything can tremble, but the message gets out. Amen? And that's what happened to this guy. He was just excited. And he didn't know what to do with himself. And he was just praising God. Hallelujah. I am set free. Indeed, I'm walking. And he was there from birth. Just think about it. Maybe you have something that happened from you since birth and you can't get rid of. Just think about it. Maybe you have a fault in your life that you just can't get rid of. Maybe you have something that disables you spiritually or physically, whatever, and you just can't seem to get rid of it. Maybe you've been there for 18 years. Maybe you've been there for 20 years. Maybe you've been there for 30 years, and you're just crying out and saying, well, if I can't do nothing else, or maybe I can you know, at least have some substitute, or maybe I can get some money for my damages. That's what he had to have. He basically had to beg for his money. Uh, and today's level is called age or something like that, the government money. And, um, and it's good. We need that, right? Or welfare or whatever. We have the aids to fulfill when we're hurting, right? Which is a blessing that we have in this country. But this, was, this is how he was surviving. He was, he was surviving off of the money to, to, to just have the, just the enough, just the barely enough just to breathe and have hope for the next day. And there, there's many people that just have the hope for the next day. They're just eating enough because they don't know what else to take in their system. And they just take that little bit to one day I'll be set free. One day somebody's going to come and say, be, rise up in Jesus' name. And so this day came, and this day came so quickly. I love it. Now I'm preaching a whole different message. Hallelujah. Verse 18. But those things which God there before had shown by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. That word fulfilled, he has so fulfilled, he has so completed you. He has so completed you. He says, verse 19, repent you therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Everybody say blotted out. Blood. That's a huge word. Blotted out. Say it one more time. I want to hear it. Blood. That's right. Then the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Just think about this. He says, I came and I refilled and I completed everything in your life. I fulfilled everything. He says, repent. This word repent says, change your mind already. Change your thinking already. Change your Doubtful thinking, change your circumstances where you stop focusing on it, just change your thinking, repent, remove yourself from those circumstances. They may not leave you, but you can at least get your thinking out of it. Repent, turn back to your insight of the Lord. It says change one's mind. It says to, um, to kind of, actually, actually means to, repent means to um, um, amend the past sins, the past errors. And we do that. Help me know this is a deliverance ministry here, and we do inner healing and we do deliverance and we do a process and we amend the past sins. We, 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 we move it and we mend it. It's like a doctor and we, we open up your spiritual man and we just kind of cut it open. We have a really good knife. It's called the Holy Ghost power and it's called the two-edged sword. Hallelujah. And we cut that open. Amen. And we look in there and we do a surgical, uh, spiritual surgical healing there. and We remove the garbage out of there. We, then we amend it. <laughs> and then we just sew it together. And oh, that's why it takes 40 days sometimes, because it takes time to heal. That's why I got delivered. What happens if you, if um, I, had used, I had a stomach surgery many years ago, what would have happened if I would have just gone and lift big, heavy things again? It would have just gone pop, pop, pop. All the staples would have just popped right out, right? I had to be careful and I had to walk slow. <laughs> Sit down slow. <laughs> you have to do that. Just drink soup, no hard food. Don't want to rip nothing. You just, it just, like, it was a pain in the butt. <laughs> it was terrible. But now it's good. Right? The other thing I had is a motorcycle accident. I, I, since then, I've been a very good driver. <laughs> I was driving along there in this big truck in front of me, and I, this is a big, nice road, and all of a sudden, this truck comes in. All of a sudden, the car didn't see me because they were waiting at the stop sign. And he's a businessman, I guess. He was in a rush. And boom. And I left the scene. 
I went in somersault and went out of, out of the whole scene. I was not in, in the scene no more. <laughs> it saved me. I didn't have to stick with my motorcycle. I went away from the accident. And it's amazing how God works. And I remember every little move. It happened in split seconds, but I remember how I somersaulted. And I had, in my mind worked so fast, I can't believe how fast God works. Oh, it, it actually made me think how to land so I wouldn't hurt myself. In those split seconds, I actually can totally remember my somersault. And as I was somersaulting, I totally see this man's face. Fearful faith. I, I, I totally see everything. And clear, I didn't know his color shirt. He had a checkered shirt, and I think it was blue and green. Kind of tinted windows, so it could have played with colors a little bit. <laughs> and, and I was somersaulting here, and I said, hi. But I didn't do that. But <laughs> that, could, that guy could have not ran away. I could, have, I could have drawn his picture that day. And this was all done in split seconds, and you have to understand the power of the Spirit within you. That's what I'm trying to say here, is that God is with you all the time. And then when I did a somersault, I had a leather jacket on, but I didn't have leather chaps on, so I knew I had to land on my leather jacket. And so I didn't want to land on my head, so I kind of went, Ugh! and then I went, Shh! The only thing that happened to me is I pulled the ligament, and that's it, because the steering wheel I held on pulled while it hit me. And so God is with us in those areas at all times. Um, I have no idea where that came from. But I believe when you look at that, that you are always protected. And God is always there. And the fact is, it took me a long time to heal. Oh, that's where I'm going with it. Now I know. So now, now it's going to feel justified by it. <laughs> right after that, I was going on a long weekend trip that day. And I was so excited. I was going to go on a, you know, 50 motorcycles at once, Christian motorcycles. I was a pre vice president of Christian Motorcycle Association. And here we're going to go. And I was so excited about it. I said, huh, I feel good. I went to my bike. And I got some Kleenex on my back and wiped my blood off my nose. And I wanted to pick up the bike. The people around me said, no, 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 don't. I said, I got to go somewhere. I'll, I'll file a report later. <laughs> you don't think straight when you're doing this. <laughs> um, trying to lift this thing up. And I saw a big hole in my motor. I said, I guess I'm not going over. And they had to persuade me to get an ambulance because I thought I was okay. The power of the mind was strong. But after I was in the hospital, man, I was hurting. Oh. That went all away. I didn't want to go nowhere that weekend. But I want, uh, what happened is that I had this, and it took a long time. I, what would have happened if I would have just gone and picked up that bike and say, I'm going no matter what? You wouldn't have healed. You would have not moved forward. Healing is a process. And you have to choose to heal when something ticks in you. You have to choose to walk the progress. And you have to choose to sacrifice whatever it takes to finish your walk in your health so that the sin cannot fear you no more. You have to choose to do that. And you have to do it, and you have to sacrifice everything you love for a moment. You've got to sacrifice every bad habit. You've got to sacrifice everything just to see that healing of God in your life sometimes. Amen? To be healed, it takes an effort. But it, let's just go back to it. It says, repent, therefore. Turn around. Change your mind. And be converted. And this word converted is this. He's talking actually to believers here. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, he's talking about, you know, the Pharisees. He's talking to the people that believe in God and so forth. And he's believing to the people that saw. But he says, be converted. This word converted is to, to actually to turn to or to worship or to cause to return. And so people say converted sometimes is just like a new creation. It isn't. It's a lot of times that it's a time of turning back. Being converted means that sometimes you've been stuck in a pattern and you feel that God is not there anymore and you have to return to his power. You have to return. You have to be reconverted into believing that he's there for you. How I many you get kind of, even in this place, we kind of get stuck and say, oh, yeah, I see him here coming for him, no problem. We've got to get reconverted. We've got to get returned back to that power so we can get the healings that we need and so that we can be free indeed, amen, from those sins. Even as Christians, we have to re be converted because we get caught into patterns and circumstances and we don't know how to deal with it and we need to go back and say, yes, that testimony is for me. I'm going to do that too because I'm going to believe for that freedom. I'm going to believe for that freedom. Jesus saved the woman here last Wednesday. Give him some praise. Amen? Let's just praise him that he saved somebody. It wasn't me, but I thank God that I had the privilege to be part of it. I thank God that we could be part of it. I thank God that God has put this ministry here for those kind of things. It made me cry because I said, God, you know, when you think about that, I, everything goes, all my financial problems, everything goes away, and I just go, <laughs> God, you did it. <laughs> oh, right on. Everything. Every, all my stress just leaves that moment when I read it this afternoon when she sent it to her. Everything just left me. Everything just left me. And I was praising God for healings again. 
I, I want to hear more of that so I don't have to be stressed, guys, okay? <laughs> the, the world itself stresses me out, but God, pray, God lifts me up. Amen? He lifts me up when stuff happens in his presence. So we need to be, it says, uh, to be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Your sins, your errors may be blotted out. I, this is why you can be converted. When you turn back to God, it, your sins get blotted out. This is an anointing or a washing of every part. A blotted oath is washing every part of you. When you call back and say, yes, Jesus, here I am. I choose to turn back to you. I choose to come to you completely. I choose to trust you completely. You get blotted out. You get washed, every part. It says to wipe it off, to wipe off your circumstance, to wipe off your past, to wipe it off completely, to wipe it off. And people say, what if I sin? No, it's wiped off. Stop thinking that way. If you can't think about it, you didn't sin. If you don't, can't understand it, if you can't pull it out of your hat, just don't bother creating it in your hat, okay? Just leave it alone. And choose to praise God that you didn't sin that day. <laughs> choose to praise God that it was a good day. Amen? The blood it out means, uh, blood it out, <laughs> not blood it out. Blood it out means this, wipe away. To, uh, to totally erase, to totally wipe out, totally to be cleansed completely. Hallelujah. This is a promise of God, guys, that you don't have to worry and fear about sin no more. You just have to choose to overcome sin. Don't fear it no more, overcome it. Don't fear it no more, overcome it. Choose not to fear it no more because fear makes you into deeper sin. Fear brings you into deeper circumstances. What happens to an addicted person of some sort of addiction, whatever it may be, gambling or something, if they feel guilty and they feel the condemned condemnation that they've done something wrong, what does usually happen? I can, I'm a minister, so I know what usually happens. They go deeper. Right? Would you agree? We need to remove that fear so we can overcome it. Until that fear is removed, we can never overcome it because we feel we're never good enough because we fear the very thing we did. We fear condemnation. We fear condemn. We feel that we're going to be condemned. But in the meantime, we're doing deeper things and we're getting deeper in the hole and we're starting to make a lifestyle out of it instead of overcoming it. We need to remove it. You need to go to bed peacefully to know that God is with you. You don't need to go to sleep and say, okay, I didn't say nothing wrong to this person. I didn't say nothing wrong. And if I did, Lord, uh, I will talk to him later. I will go to bed and knowing that I'm going to go to heaven if I die today. Amen? You are born again indeed. Amen? And so no more, no more worries, worries. Worries, and we just need to walk into that place of total freedom in Christ Jesus. And so, on my last scripture of the day, which I have more, but I'm gonna just read one more scripture. Second uh, Corinthians five, seventeen and eighteen. Therefore, any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Everybody say he is. He is. He is a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. All things pass away means all things depart. When you choose to have, be a new creation, this is the salvation message here. If you choose to walk in a new creation, that means you don't do old things no more. You might be addicted, you might be attached to something, something might control you, but your heart moves forward. You move forward in Christ Jesus. You are a new creation. You desire new things. And it says, and all things are of God, who has reconciled, which means he has reconcile us to himself. He has changed us to himself. That word reconcile means to change him, you to him. Meaning that we are part of him. We are changed as a body to himself because he's the head and we are the body. We are reconciled to himself. We are a changed personality. We are a changed person. <laughs> Hallelujah. To himself. Hallelujah. To us, to himself, Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of I can't say it very good. Re-reconciliation, something like that. Pretty close, eh? I mean, huh? And this word in the New Testament is this. It's a restoration back to the favor of God. To the sinners that repent and put their trust in completely into the death of Christ and his resurrection. Jesus Christ himself is here today. And if you want to really have it, know that you are a new creation. Meaning that you have the ability to leave things behind. You have the ability to let the old pass away. You have that ability in the church, in the body of Christ, to let it pass away. I want to let it pass away. And I want to see it go to death. I want to see it for... One thing you have to know, to think about something and to remember something is two different things, okay? You can't think about those things no more, but you will remember them. When you think about it, it's a worry status. When you remember it, it's a victory status. You have to remember what God has taken you through. 
but you can't think about what it did to you. You have to choose to let it go, and you have to choose to walk in new creation power today. If you're born again, you're going to have this power in your heart, and when those things come your way, you will feel in your heart that God is not in it or he is in it. You will feel it. And you will know that you're born again because you're not cold-hearted. But you will say, yes, I'm convicted. And I choose to act upon my conviction. And when you choose to act upon your conviction, God can set you free indeed. Amen? Are you with me?